Um, given that yesterday people uh, talked about, I wanted to know about workflow tools, I'll start off uh, right off with workflow tools. Um, so, um, I where the first question is, you know, what are actually workflows? And I think, you know, uh, like by, by a broad definition, everything is a workflow, like getting up in the morning, take your coffee and sit in front of your, you know, PC to start your work. That's, that's a workflow, right? That gets you, gets you into your work day. But uh, we're thinking of workflows, that a workflow is a problem that's better solved by inserting automation tools between the user and the computational resources. And the workflow management tools are the software system that perform uh, that automation. And if you use a workflow management tool, you know, what, what can get better? And then one thing that can get better is that, uh, you know, you, you let the tool do like uh, repetitive, urgent, or recovery tasks automatically. You can, um, you can have abstract away slurms. You don't actually have to deal with like the scheduler or you want to organize large amounts of data. And uh, you might also want to, you know, have like a dashboard that informs you about your progress. All this comes with, with workflow tools. So some, you know, examples that we hear at Nurse, like, you know, that's probably also relevant for you. You know, I need to run my application thousands of times, like, like MD simulations or biological simulations, whatever. And, um, then the other one is the typical dark. So you have like a complicated workflow interdependence between different stages of the processing, and they have to run in a specific order, and you know they have to maybe have time limits to this. And then the other one is that these um, the the tools maybe scale out a bit, and then they have the the tendency of crashing, so they need to be re rescheduled every time. Um, and the other one is like timed applications, you know. That's, that's essentially like processing runs that we have, like for example, from telescopes that say like we want to make a full scale processing run uh, every uh, once a month. And um, at NERSC, we uh, kind of pride ourselves to support uh, workflows a lot. So we actually have like a workflows working group. Um, we formed it in 2019 when I started. And uh, when we, um, when we started the group, we actually looked at you know, the workflow landscape and decided on how to go, go forward. And uh, we went with the approach of um, providing like, very detailed documentation about how a workflow uh, tool mapped to NERSC resources, and also reached out to the developers where necessary and asked them to contribute to the documentation. And I think it's kind of a successful approach because you kind of, in this dialogue, you figure out how to best, um, you know, support that workflow tool. And um, we also really love to get tickets. So if you have like a complicated workflow, you know, instead of just trying to do it yourself, you really like, to, like an open question. You send us a ticket and ask, you know, I want to do this. Uh, can you please help me uh, map that to a workflow tool or can you give me some proper advice? And we're more than happy uh, to help you out in that case. And that's uh, for us is cool because um, we get to know what people want, and we also may learn about a new workflow tool that's worth supporting uh, going forward. So, um, for example, you can take a look uh, here. That's where we uh, assemble our workflow tools. It's just, I think six or seven that we highlighted. But we go really uh, go to great detail. We, we we have examples. We talk about pitfalls, and um, and these documentations are living documents, so we, whenever something changes on our side or on the tool side, we will try to update that. And so here's an, an example, so we try to be very honest. You know, there's a, every tool has like an advantage and a disadvantage section. And um, so for example, for parser, you know, there is like, it's a Python thing, so it's kind of, it's kind of cool. We have good, it has good documentation, great, you know, community, et cetera. But if you don't configure it correctly, parcel might just be like some um, syntactic sugar on top of a scheduler, and you might not you might not benefit um, from all the features that parcel has. So, you know, there's like advantages and disadvantages to this. And then yesterday, I also also um, if you want to ask a question or want to interrupt me, um, please do that anytime, right? Um, so common workflow patterns that we have is that this is the typical one. It's like I would say 95% of the requests that we get for workflow pattern is essentially just a bag of tasks. 
Uh, I don't have like a good graphic here, but essentially just like, you know, whatever um, pleasantly parallel uh, application of, you know, just uh, like hundreds of tasks. It's very similar, just the input arguments might be different. And, you know, we, we kind of, there's like very easy tools for like the very low level at GNU Parallel that we support, it's just installed on the system. Or you can, if you have a, that workflow wrapped, uh, uh, you know, packaged up in a Jupyter notebook, you can use paper mail. <laughs> and then for the more evolved uh, workflows, you know, they're usually expressed in some form of task graph where there's complex dependencies between the tasks. And we also have like a bunch of tools at NERSC, be, a bunch of workflow tools that we support at NERSC for this like task is very um, popular. So from the Python side, and if you, this in Fireworks is more from like the batch uh, side, just instruments um, slurm here. And parser kind of sits in between and can kind of do both. Um, but the important thing to know, and I think that came up yesterday, is that um, at, at NERSC we kind of police um, the um, the jobs at the at the at the scheduler level. So when when a job gets submitted, we don't know if it's part of a workflow or not. So we treat every job the same. And this is, has this uh, we have this rule that only two of, of your jobs, you know, per constraint or per petition at a time, gain priority. And that is, if you submit like a hundred jobs with S batch, it means like ninety eight jobs will wait while well, two jobs will gain, gain in priority and will be scheduled eventually. But only when they're run, the next two jobs will uh, gain priority. So that can be, can be tricky. And that's why you might want to run, you know, your workflow task inside an allocation, get like a big, um, uh, like a big block, and then use a, to a workflow manager tool that can actually run inside the allocation, um, like a task, for example, or parcel. And yeah, I think that's, that's generally the case. So if you want to run a specific workflow management to any, anything, and you kind of figure out in the way, um, when you're reading through the tool, that it's essentially what all, all that it does, it submits stuff with s -Budge. You know, it, you should kind of be a bit careful in, in using that in, 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 at NERSC or any other HPC facility. All right, and then one thing I also want to point out, um, yeah, whenever somebody talks about workflow tools, they have this XKCD comic in mind, right? So, um, you know, you've, you look at around and you kind of just get, after a short while, you give up and say like, oh, this is not my workflow management tool. So I'm just, that's, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm, I can do it better. You make another one and suddenly there's another workflow management tool. And, and uh, when we did the survey first, there were 300 and more workflow tools out there. Each of them supports their, like, their own domain. Um, so, like, I think the better approach would be, you know, you reach out to us, you reach out to the community, uh, or you contribute to another workflow management tool and try to adjust it to your needs or ex expand it rather than making your own one. I think that, also that, that, is, that benefits the community overall better. So, in order to give you the opportunity to do this, um, and part of DOE and NSF started this workflow community initiative. Um, you can go to the web page or scan the QR code here. And it's a really nice uh, web page and has, big no it has a knowledge base on all the kind of workflow, management, workflow managers and tools. And um, we have like a community summit, uh, I think at least once a year. So this is really a great, um, great place to, uh, to learn about workflow tools, to go to any of those meetings and to get in touch with, any, with anybody else that probably has a similar problem than you. And um, also, we, we are now starting to, to do this collaboration also inside of DOE HPC, HPC facilities. So, um, so we're really like um, the first, the first uh, uh, event. Uh, I don't know if it ever happened again, but we make a joint ALCF, NERSC, and OSCF training, a half-day training on the topic of workflows. We, have, we highlight four different uh, workflow tools. And, you know, cover like, you know, general questions, you know, do I need a workflow tool, which one do I choose, you know, benefits, disadvantages, etc. Um, and we hope we get some good participation. And we try to, to narrow it down to tools that, you know, uh, work already work at HPC facilities or um, that, are, that are meant for HPC facilities. All right, any question here? 
Okay, now I'm gonna, this um, presentation is about uh, complex workflows and um, you know, I'm, I'm a physicist by training. I come from a synchrotron. Um, I have not actually done HPC computing in like before five years ago. Um, so I'm kind of from the, I'm coming from the, from the experimental physicist side. And um, NERSS supports a whole range of, um, you know, HPC uh, experimental observational uh, facilities. So this is more like a data uh, flow um, centric um, workflow. <laughs> and yeah, so that's going to show you a bit of an example um, and uh, to motivate it and then cover like all the, um, the services that NERSC has that you can use for, for your workflows or your data flows. All right, so um, LBL is blessed with having a whole lot of um, scientific user facilities on campus. So this is the, an aerial view, and here this is building 59. We, are ho we, we host NERSC in 59 and also ESNet, which is the Energy, Energy Science Network. Then there's the JGI right next to it, the ALS, the Advanced Light Source, the Synchrotron, and then here's the National Center for Electron Microscopy, which is part of the molecular foundry. So these are all user facilities, and they all have um, huge needs for compute uh, in analyzing the data. So just an example, um, this is like the Advanced Light Source, one of the, if you ever get a logo of LBL, that's the, that's the shape they put on it. It's, um, that it's, I think it's one of, one of the very early buildings uh, on campus, and it's just very beautiful. So it's a software X-ray synchrotron, has 2,000 users annually, uh, 50 users on site every day, a whole lot of staff, and 40 beam lines. And if you don't know what a synchrotron is, I think um, m many of you might not even know. Uh, so a synchrotron is just like, there's like a, the, an electron storage ring, the electron go in a circle, each time an electron gets deflected, it emits a pulse of light. And you can finely tune that pulse of light and has very high coherence characteristics. And you drive it all the way to extreme, you end up at a free electron laser, which is um, But these, the, the benefit of having these, uh, these light sources is you can very nicely analyze chemical, and material, chemical processes and materials and biological specimen. And if you ever went to one of these user facilities, you essentially just sit in a bunch, you sit next to the experimental hutch in front of a whole bunch of monitors. And this is how you interact uh, with this, with this specific facility. And you want to keep that, uh, that view in mind because that's how they, that's how they see the world and not quite through a terminal um, as many HPC, as many HPC folks do. All right. So this is an example, very easy one. Um, that is how it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tomography um, beam line here. And this is the detector uh, right behind it. So this, is a, this does make this a toy tomography of a gummy bear. But I wanna, wanna uh, let's just go back and show it once more. So what it does, it takes an image per angle or half angle. So it's a whole, whole lot of images that come out of, this, it's out of there. So it's a lot lots and lots of data, and they produce this data fast, you know, in terms of LCS, it goes to like a fast feedback buffer. Um, in LCS, in, at, at ALS, it just lands on some file server anyway, but they need to, need some way to deal with all the data, and that's where HPC uh, comes in. So what do our ALS friends actually need from us? And that's the first, the f number one priority was always how can we get the data off the synchrotron and into some facility that can hand actually handle data. So they need a fast way to send the data. There's also another aspect to this is that, you know, the, the machine actually produces the data, not the user, really. The user clicks the button and puts in the sample. So, and the users, they rotate a lot. So not every user that comes to, um, to uh, synchrotron actually will end up being like an HPC user. They just want to, they just want, um, you know, the materials to be analyzed. So um, what they need is like a, some way that, um, that the machine can interface with this. So this is a machine or service user that comes to the need. Then also they can't wait in the queue, uh, obviously, because if they, uh, if you heard about uh, Johanna's talk yesterday, essentially there's a, there's a feedback loop going on. So they, um, they put the sample in, they, they measure it, the data comes out, and they need 
you know, uh, to, uh, to make a decision about what to do next. And essentially sometimes, and, and that's what when I was at Synchrotrons, you were running blind mostly. You took the sample in, you take the data, it goes through the pipeline, but the machine is finished. So now you're just wasting time wa uh, waiting for you know, the results to return. You don't have that time. You put in the next sample and you go. I mean, if you do make the wrong decisions about parameters and you don't know what the result is, essentially just the, the, whole, the, whole, um, uh, the whole time span is gone. So this is really having a fast feedback is really uh, uh, good about productivity and really just um, you know, it's, added, it's a lot of added value to uh, such a facility. And of course, you go to all the niceties. So you want to you want to kind of just once you have like an established workflow, you want to put it into some place where it has a nice GUI and everything. So you need to like a persistent service in databases to kind of look up what, what kind of samples you have analyzed and all that. And that also is, is, is nice for the user if they, you can just have a GUI to click on buttons. And, um, and then there is an, another thing that happens often is, so they take the data, they take their ma material to the, uh, to the beam line, they do their initial analysis, but then actually um, that's not the one that they're going to publish. It's just going to be, it's just news for feedback. So what they need afterwards is they need a, a way to continue analyzing the sample. It's kind of a, a handoff between the experimental facility and, and, and computing facility, and they need to be given the right tools to continue an, uh, analyzing it. And they're not necessarily, um, you know, people that are, are um, comfortable uh, with, uh, with a terminal. So, um, they need some, some other way to actually analyze the data than, than logging in. And then of course, uh, you know, once, once you deem the data is good you know, to keep, you want to archive it and because it's the, pro the, the publication process takes a long time. Um, so they want to they wanna have some way to store the data for, for extended periods. And I'm just gonna uh, show the slide from Johannes yesterday. So what you, this is really, and we love circles you now as diagrams. So you really want to go uh, for loop all the time, um, you know, get the data, put it in storage, make the analysis, you know, make decisions about it, and start all over again. So the first, um, the first part of the circle is moving the data, and that might not be, uh, you know, all that relevant for. I mean, can I get see who is actually using experimental data for the analysis, or who is dealing with the experimental data here? Hands up, one, two, three at least. Yeah, so for you it might not be so interested getting the data in or getting the data out, but you know, it's still, it's, it's still a very crucial part of these workflows. So I recall yesterday from Johannes, he's like, we have a whole bunch of storage systems, but for, for us to get like uh, the data into NERSC, our preferred tool is Globus. Um, we support it, and we have a license for it, and we support it also with, uh, you know, internally, the people keep it running and have, the, have some staff commitment to make it work properly. Um, it has a really nice uh, web UI, um, so you can, it's, it's super, super easy to move the data with it, and uh, every nurse can use it, and um, we have specific end, endpoints that are uh, optimized for data transfers, and you, you, it's great documentation out there. And what I like most about it is it has an API. So if you if you build like uh, some workflow tool, you can just you know, and if it's in Python or in any other language that they support in their clients, you can just it's just simply you know slot in some uh, data movement. That's pretty cool, I think. Um, and if you don't want to use Globus, we have uh, general purpose data transfer nodes. Those are dedicated servers for moving data in into NERSC or in, in at NERSC between storage tiers. Uh, it's uh, connected to a high bandwidth network and uh, it's tightly monitored. So you can go to all the NERSC file systems and the scratch file systems and, and really they're, they should be used only for data transfers and not for anything else. Um, that's what they're, what they're made for. Uh, so if you, if you want to use like a tool like XRD or any other tool, uh, you probably end up using one of these data transfer nodes. And another cool thing that uh, if, you, if you're in the DOE complex, 
is that you can um, benefit from, from the SNAP, which is like uh, you know, a separate internet just for data transfer and has like you know, also specific words set on top of it for, for science DMZ. So it's very easy to, to move data in between sites at high speeds. And I kind of just highlighted a few. Here's like um, Argonne National Lab, Brookhaven, Oak Ridge. So these are here, here compute facilities, but also um, facilities that produce data. Yeah, there's, these two have synchrotrons. Uh, Ebenet has one. There are, be, below there is Slack. And I actually had users when I was at, um, at, uh, at the advanced light source who were from UCLA. And it was super, it was super easy. Just like, you know, they lo we, we opened the global uh, the web UI. They locked in on their side. I, lo I locked in on, on the ALS side. And we just shoved the data over. And it was, it was transported, you know by the end of the, of the beam time. So it's very convenient um, and it's very, it works very, very well. And then another thing that we did uh, in order to um, you know, satisfy the requirements of having like, service accounts and data movement, it's what's called a global collaboration endpoint. Um, so the, the, it solves a very particular problem. So, if you if you if you put yourself in the um, in the position of an instrument, want to copy uh, Globus data into uh, um, Globus copy data into NERSC, um, then if you if you log into NERSC, you you, are, you assume the identity of, of your own um, you assume your own identity. So all the data that's being copied over will land on NERSC under your name, and it's not immediately shareable with uh, with your uh, collaborators. So um, what we did here is that, um, and as we have a specific uh, type of accounts, it's called a collaboration account. And collaboration account is just maps to like a Unix group. Essentially, anybody who is in the Unix group can, you know, take the identity of the uh, collaboration account, and we extended it to uh, Globus. So we create specific endpoints in Globus uh, for that collaboration account, and then you can copy to that collaboration account at NERSC. And the data will arrive um, in the name of the service account. That um, it's a huge help for our our partners. So it will look a bit like this. Um, this is like parts of the Globus UI, and um, this uh, this endpoint or this uh, it's called collection in Globus. This one is actually named uh, has the name of a service account here, and um, as you copy the data over. And you make a, you check it out. So you go on, you go on like a nurse. You assume the identity of the collaboration of this collaboration account, and you see uh, that the data that has been copied actually um, has the right ownership. That's really helpful uh, for our for our users. And so then uh, that whenever they don't actually have to change anything, they only add and delete people from the Unix group, and they can continue to use the same uh, same account. Okay, so we covered data copy. The next thing that they want, that people want, is uh, fast processing, right? And we have um, we have uh, the queue set up at NERSC mm -hmm. to uh, to accommodate these users. So if you look at if you go to uh, docs and gov and you look at um, all the different queues that we have. I think this is, it's actually, if you go to docs and gov, it's one of the first links you see on the page. It's very, uh, it's very helpful uh, to see what's going on. This gets updated um, frequently for queue committee makes new decisions. But if you look at the queues, um, I pointed out four. Four of these seven queues here is actually kind of related uh, to science and data workflows. So um, like the interactive queue, um, it's very helpful for our, for our users to do some online uh, analysis, you know, while they're doing the experiments. Then Jupyter, of course, because Jupyter is a, is a preferred data science, data analysis tool. And then uh, preempt that is uh, that was briefly discussed yesterday, where you put on jobs that can be preempted. And then uh, a very very special QS for our um, partner facilities, which is called real time. And this is a this is. Uh, if you submit jobs to these, um, 
you know, you get like a super high priority and it puts you very uh, much ahead of the queue. So you can be sure that your job runs almost immediately. Um, but this requires, you know, special access. So you would need to reach out uh, to us. So in, in addition, uh, to all of this, we also allow for reservations. So for example, if you, if you know that you have like a specific measurement campaign, a specific uh, time period, um, you fill out a ticket and say, I want to have this many nodes for that, for that time, and you, get, uh, you will get charged for it. Um, but once you have a reservation, you know that the nodes in there are av available to you immediately. So that's, that's been used um, quite a lot for SCS um, uh, beam time runs. We also use it for um, training events where we, where we know that the users need to get on and um, start their, their jobs uh, you know, in, the, in, in, the, in the course so that they cannot submit a job and then wait you know, until the next day until they get results. It has to happen the same day. So there are many reasons to use the reservation. And if you have a good reason, um, you should uh, fill out a ticket and ask for a reservation. Right, so there's, you, don't have, you don't have to be an experimental facility, and you don't have to have a training event. It's all been decided on your, um, on your reasoning. Right, so the real-time QS, just going a bit about detail, um, can use it both uh, in batch mode interactive. I said it's only available to special request. Um, but the cool thing is not shared with other users or projects, so it's really, um, you know, all the, the notes on it are really just for you. Um, the, if you want to use it, you have, again, to give a really good reason. It's not just saying, I don't, the, the, you can't say, you know, um, it takes too long for my, my jobs to run. That's not, that's not enough. You have to make a, a, a good scientific reason, you know, why you want to use the real-time QS. And we, we're usually very we're, um, accommodating, so, you know, we would like to help you out. Um, Okay, um, and then of course, um, the the real time QS in the very nature is is quite uh, quite not what Slurm is meant to be. Slurm is meant to you know kind of fill like an HPC the the an HPC uh, compute um, you know to pack it most densely and not to react to like immediate requests. So each time you submit a, re, uh, a job to the real-time queue, it's a little disruption. And we actually have like a, a pool of nodes set to the side to just cover, you, cover this little burst. So we actually keep a few, a few nodes um, reserved for it. And the rest will get um, uh, pushed to the, to the regular queue. But it's, it's quite disruptive. It's not really what our sysadmins uh, like, but it's, it's a requirement from our, from our science teams. So that's why the, the limit is just, you know, 10 to 20 nodes that you get, not more. Because otherwise it's just way too disruptive. Um, but any, again, uh, we're, we're, none of the rules are set in stone. Everything is, um, is decided, you know, and, and can is decided like continuous uh, all the time. Uh, so we, we change our, our rules, you know, uh, given, to, uh, given by the needs of our partners. And... Um, of course, we can't, as Johannes said, we, can't, we, we don't choose our users. So if someone comes in and says, you know, I have this outlandish requirement, you know, we really try to accommodate them. And if you might have wondered why I put the preempt into the data science experimental workflows to here's a, a slide um, that, uh, that uh, I think is quite cool because the preemptible job queue and urgent computing, they kind of complement each other. So, um, if, if you are more on the side that I want to have like, I want to get as much com compute for my money or for my NERSC hours, then you might want to be tempted to go to the preemptive queue. And uh, the, the cool thing is you can couple this with like the bursty workload of, ex of experimental facilities to say, you know, I really need to get on the system now. And then this, this can be balanced and it's like you, you can, the, the urgent loads will come on and push out the ones that are not urgent but want to, you know, want to save some node hours by being on the preemptive queue. Um, so I think, I think we try that. I think Johannes is the best uh, uh, person to talk about this. But um, I think it would be cool to kind of uh, match that uh, better in the future. So if you, if you are like a person who, um, who wants to run in the preemptive queue and you want to match it maybe to like a, a beam, uh, 
beam time campaign. I think that would be a, a cool thing to do and just really see how, how well that plays off it against each other. All right. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is Spin. Spin is um, it's our platform for services. And it might not be so relevant for you, but a lot of our um, uh, customers, so a lot of our users, they actually need uh, more than HPC. You know, they, um, they need to kind of collect the state, they need to have some persistent services, they need like a, some, some web UI um, to, uh, to track their, um, the status of their jobs or actually to manage the data that they have in there or essentially just to, to, um, to, just, to just manage everything they do, right? And then they have, the, and they, have the, they build these apps um, can be workflow manager, science gateways, anything, and they uh, want this this service to be up all the time, and want their users to primarily interact with the service and not really interact uh, with NERSC underneath. So this is um, this is our response to that, and um, the what Spin can do for you is can access the HPC file system network. So it's it's actually not running on uh, on Cori or Permata; it runs on its own clusters next to it and it's connected uh, over the file systems. And you can really run your own or, or, uh, your own or public software images. And uh, it's um, you know, secure, scalable, and managed uh, based on Rancher and Kubernetes. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty cool. A lot of, uh, like almost all of our science engagement uh, projects use BIN to, to have some form of app um, running there. And um, here's just a few examples. Um, so here, like, as you use it to process real-time events for dark matter detection, or um, there's a use it to track and compare an analysis of night sky, night sky service. Yeah, ALS has, um, what's, what's the service called? Um, has a catalog app running. Ansem has their app running on it. And, and um, as you've seen yesterday, um, CCTV access it also runs part of their workflow managers on, on, on Spin. So the way you use Spin is um, it has this build chip. One workflow, so you build the, the images locally, and then you ship it out to the registry. You can use Docker Hub if you want to have it a, a public one, but we also have uh, a private registry. So if you don't want to share your code with the world, you know you can you can you can upload it to, to our registry. And then these, these images get pulled into Spin, and then they run there. And the cool thing about the, what Spin is that we're using, using Rancher, so it, and it can, it can do both ways. It can do, you can do everything with YAML files and over the command line. But you can also, it, it, you can also use the, the, the GUI and really you know, play around. You click the button, download the image. And it's a kind of a, it's a really cool play thing. This kind of got me into Spin. It's, um, just so easy to get your workloads running. It's pretty cool. Um, so as a, from an architecture point of view, um, the thing in the yellow box is what you do. This is just you know, uh, defining apps and the, the images and tell how they relate to each other and what they use of each other. But you, you don't really say on which node it's running. That's, that's decided by the infrastructure un underneath. And it's also and it's connected to like, you know, to our file systems here, and um, also has like um, has also its own um, storage uh, connected to the to the clusters. So if that's something interesting to you. Um, so users get access uh, through a specific training that we offer. It's called Spin Up. It's a lecture, uh, one day and then a hackathon like a week after, so that the, the, well, everything you learned is still fresh in mind. Mm -hmm. And if you're already experienced, you can, also, you can do self-guided training. We use that, for example, for everyone who has, has done, like, has, like, has used Kubernetes before, or has used the Rancher one before. And um, we have a bunch of uh, consultants that try tickets to, um, for spin. I'm, I'm one of those, Johannes is one of those. And then we also have like, you know, if you want to have face-to-face -face time, we offer office hours every, every other Friday uh, by appointment. And we also have, you know, uh, a large amount of documentation um, out there. 
But the, I think one, one thing to highlight is not only liked by our users, but we like Spin too. So we, everything that, oh, a lot of our services, we actually put on Spin, and Spin has a reserved instance. That's just, it's a, a privileged instance that is, is used for, for nurse services. Okay. Um, so it, it talked about, oh yeah, sorry. So like, is the Spin like, like a public cloud? Well, if you want to get in, you need to have a, you need to have a US NERSC account. So it's 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 our cloud. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So like, like if we like collected a lot of data and, and maybe our national lab is not so easy of like giving us opportunity to share this with the world, would NERSC provide that? Yeah. So what you can do is if you want to if you want to build like a web front end, like it's typically would be a catalog app, right? Where you kind of just you write like. Um, something that, that access the data on the file system underneath and presents it in a nice way in a, in a user interface. So what you can do is, and that's um, a lot of our uh, projects do that. They, they upload the data to a nurse, to one of our file systems. Uh, typically, they use the archive for that and a little bit of CFS like as a, you know, a burst storage. And then, and then the app just connects to, just can just connect to the, um, to the file system and can load the data and serve it over spin. Although at a certain time, you know, if, if it, you have a certain size, you might want to save it, uh, serve it through the web UI, but provide other, me other means to, to serve it to users, like Globus, for example. Uh, but yeah, it's, very common, it's a very common uh, use case, yeah. And we, I think, call it a science gateway apps, right, yeah. And again, if you, if you, if you would just want to know about it, you can always just reach out to us. And same for the workflow tools, if you, um, if you, you can just openly ask the question in a ticket and say, I want to do this, could you help me out? We love these tickets, actually. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. All right, so um, next I'm going to talk about the API, and it's called uh, Supervisor API. It's a successor to uh, Newt, which was our first API. And just because why it's called Super Facility API, we had this Super Facility project at NERSC, and that is essentially, again, here's a circle. <laughs> it's a way to, the Super Facility project was a way to integrate experimental facilities, the networks, the computer research department, and an HPC center at NERSC to uh, work together. Yeah, so we had like, there were a lot of separate engagements uh, between uh, experimental facilities and CRD, ESNet, NERSC. But they weren't really coordinated. But there were a lot of things that, 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 that the folks needed. Um, so it's kind of, um, there were synergy effects uh, out there that weren't necessarily used. And that's why we uh, made the Supervisory project to kind of coordinate this. And um, as project goal, you know, three of our si seven science applications and engagements uh, will demonstrate automated pipelines. And I think we succeeded in that project. We went, went for way more, went beyond demonstration. A lot of these things went into production. Uh, but um, the capabilities that they used was, that I want to highlight here is real-time computing support, which, uh, which we do, uh, the Globus movement, but also API-driven automation. And um, the, the reason you want to you wanna have an API is that it meets a very uh, critical need. That if you if you live at that beam line, you don't want to, you know, the data set is there. I log into NERSC and I click a, a execute a shell script that will analyze the data. So you need some form of automation, and you want to minimize the human in the loop. And um, that's really what you need an API for. You know, all these complex workflows and the different projects that really ask they're really asking for it. And the cool thing I like about it is like you know the NERSC. If you have built a good API, NERSC kind of becomes machine readable, and that means they can build local tools, uh, local uh, user interfaces, and they can um, kind of integrate NERSC without the user knowing. So this is kind of this gives this, um, uh, this these control software analysis software that has like a NERSC, NERSC inside feel. So even they can they can maybe use it locally, but when it's too much data, they just have it tooled in a way press a button, and it would, would run at NERSC. And the, yeah, the, really, the, the real driver is like having the, the closed feedback loops with your, um, with your, cent with your facility partners. OK, um, so what is it? Um, if you can take a look at it, actually, if you go to that URL up, up there. 
uh, that will prompt you with a with what's called a Swagger page. It shows, it, it shows you the interface definition of our of our API. So it's a REST API with JSON input output, a very uh, very modern standard based authentication uh, with OAuth. Uh, we have extensive documentation, of course, and uh, as I said before, we use Spin for our service too. So our API actually runs on Spin. Um, so what can you do with the API? So the idea is um, that all interactions um, with NERS are callable and they facilitate uh, seamless automated uh, workflows without a human in the loop. And here are the prototypes that we prototype. And you know, typical one we would be status to create the system status health, but also compute to actually run a job or check on jobs. And uh, you know, otherwise, like utilities, you know, like LS, for example, is utility that we expose uh, in the API. And here's, for example, an example request. Like you, you carry out this uh, command in your on your terminal, and you would get like a JSON response back. And if you can, you can integrate that into your workflow tool, and it would, for example, tell you if the machine is up or down, and you can use that to. Um, to display that, to kind of trans transfer that to your users um, and make a decision. Or you can say, okay, well, permutas down, I might want to use a different facility today. So that if, if every, every facility had an API, it would be very easy to write the tooling to, to move workflows between um, facilities. And here is an example how it's used at NERSC. For example, if you go to JupyterHub and you see that yellow box, JupyterHub itself pulls the API to figure out what the status is on the systems, and it figures out that there's something, there's some some system it knows that has uh, is degraded. It will it will show this yellow box, and it will tell you, you know, Jupyter. You might not have the best Jupyter experience today because one of the services connected to uh, is experiencing difficulties. Okay, so going about a bit more examples, um, right? You know, check check status usually would be you either go to the to the web page, but if you want to do it automatically, you would have to SSH or ping services. But now you can go to the status API. You know, submitting a job, you would do it with SSH in and S batch. But now you can do it over the compute endpoint, etc. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, if you want to use the API um, uh, for using a, the API has two components. It's uh, it has public interfaces, and it has authenticated interfaces. And uh, the public interface is meta and status, for example. So if you want to build like a tool that just want to check you know, how is NOS NOS doing today, uh, you don't need any authentication for this. But if you want to interact with NOS beyond that, uh, you would need to go through the authenticated endpoints. And if you want to use one of those, you would first need to uh, create what we call a client. Uh, in a client, you, you kind of tell um, what kind of uh, what kind of capabilities you want, and depending on how much of a you know security uh, security threat that is, you might get you know a less uh, a shorter lifetime and and less IPs you can use it from. But if it's really not critical, you can have like you know long lasting clients like sixty days, and they can be used from a whole like from from many sites or from very large uh, DOE labs because it allows you a lot of IP ranges. Um, so you, you can do that today if you want. If you go on Iris, you can try to make a client. Um, but if you are actually you know, interested in building the API on your end, please reach out. Um, we, we'd like to collaborate. And so OCF has already reached out. Um, we, we, we really want to see API adoption in many more facilities so that you know, it's, we can really build cross-facility workflows more easily. So it's a process. You get your client. You get your credentials. And then use like standard library to create like sign a client assertion, and that is this uh, is then exchanged for a short a short term access token, and that token you will use uh, in the API. And actually, if you go to the to the UI page api.nurse.gov version 1.2, um, then you can use the token in there, um, and then you can already interact through the UI uh, with with NERSC. Now I have a, a short video. Let's see. No, that didn't work. In this video, I show you how uh, the API has been used. So this runs actually on Jupyter. 
Um, I've used this, this demo like a couple of times for like um, BOFs or DOE events. So this is just like syntactic sugar in, in Python. So you can, you read, because you just read JSON input, you submit JSON, you get JSON back. But you need to kind of, you, this is just like some Python tooling to encode, to encode it. So what we're doing down there is we get like um, the, the JAW, the JSON, the, the short term access token to actually uh, use the API. And here I'm, it's a bit faster than I thought. So what happens here, we're actually gonna inquire the status. So it goes to a status Cori in this case. And what is, uh, what, what, what you figure out here, the Cori is unavailable. So if you had like a tool that, that, that does this, um, this query, it will not find you can't use Cori. But uh, good for us, we have more than, compute, more than one compute system. So we're just gonna go through all the services that we wanna know about. And you see here that Cori is, is not, all right. I mean, what you saw, Cori was not available, but everything else works. <laughs> and if you want to plan ahead, you can also check all the outages that we're, that we're doing, that we're, we're put in the system that was just before. And then uh, the next thing is to transfer in data. In this case, the demo didn't, uh, didn't work. There was like some technical issues. Uh, but um, going forward, now you're going to... Um, create and run a job. So you can actually, you don't actually have to create that job script on, in, on, um, and on NERSC. You can actually make it and copy it over. This is the, just the command endpoint here. And you're just, I'm just cutting in the script that you, um, that you made locally. And what's happening next now, it's checking in if it's, if it's there. And here it says that it's, it has arrived. And now we use the same job script to submit it to the queue. And what, what happens is that the, the submit um, button is asynchronous because you don't know when the job's actually gonna run. So you submit it and then you get a, you get a task ID back. And you can check on, um, you can also check on, um, what I'm doing, I'm checking on S account. Um, that's kind of just checking in like if the job is running or not. So this, this what I showed here is that it actually kind of just go through all the uh, information that you have. Well, I'm actually way slower than I thought I am. Sorry. Jump a bit ahead, apologies. Okay, so here I'm checking in on all the job information data with the S account. So if you wanna check if your job is running or not, you can pass the output, which I'm doing here. I'm checking on the state. So I'm, the first one is just to see what's, what's, what, can the, what the endpoint can produce. And the second one is actually just using that, um, that information in a, more, in a shorter statement to check on the status. So here you know that the job is running. And you can use the same endpoint to also cut the, the logs of the job. So here I'm running a typography code. You can check on the check on the status, check the logs, and eventually you find out that the job has completed. And that's one of the ways you can interact with NERSC. And you can instrument this. This is runs on a Jupyter notebook, but um, this is just for demonstration purposes. So we actually have. Um, I actually want to give an example of how it's been used like, in practice. So you use, can do this all for exploration, but then you want to bake it into like a final product. So uh, the one that I'm, I'm always showing is NSEM, that's the National Center for Electron Microscopy. They have an, um, a camera in there, um, 40 STEM camera, 40 STEM microscope. Um, it has a whole, it had the, the, uh, the, the single feature of this, it actually has an output at 480 gigabits per second. And um, so it's very bursty. And um, so they make, they collect like a one, one K by one K scan um, in uh, 15 seconds and it produces 650 gigabits, gigabytes of data. Now that data is being copied over from receiver nodes onto like a local server. And then what they, what they did is they, they built an app uh, in SPIN that instruments the API to pull the data off that server into uh, one of our storage tiers and then run um, 
what they call a counting job. Essentially, it's mostly zeros in that data. Um, but they want to identify the individual electron hits and, um, and count these events. And so the way, sorry, and you can build quite complicated uh, architectures with, with spin. But what it does, essentially, there's a lot of uh, signaling mechanisms in there, and it instruments a file transfer using VBCopy. Um, and it's all delivered to, through one, one app. And this is how it looks like. It looks very much like a catalog app. So it's a catalog app, and it's a job submission app at the same time, developed by uh, Chris Harris at Kitware. And it's Kitware. Chris Harris now works for us, <laughs> which I think is pretty cool. Um, so here's like another, another screencast on how it works. So this is a local app. It actually runs only on their uh, on the computer at the at the beam line. They have like all these data. It it, it um, you know catalogs all these data sets, and you will know what what has been happened to it. Um, you can change the metadata on it. But what you what's really interesting is now you can press this button. It says count, and they they just say okay, I want to have this specific threshold for counting, and everything that happens. So the user wouldn't even know. So the data is now pulled into NERSC. It's 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 analyzed on NERSC, and then reported back that this that it's that it's done. Um, but really, that's absolutely this this whole workflow is very unassuming to the user. It's very they, they, it's instrumented so well. They're using this constantly. It's a production it's a production app that instruments the API. Um, I think that's that's just really really amazing uh, work that has been done, and it's it's so cool that. You know, it's the user wouldn't. The user doesn't even know that they that they're using NERSC underneath. We're gonna supercharge it in the future. I have like a I have a postdoc, an ESA postdoc. Um, so currently, it, there's a whole of um, I/O in that app happening, but we want to replace it all with streaming over ZMQ, so the receiver knows just that the data gets just uh, uh, bounced off the the detector support machine. But will not never will never go to the file system. We just be forwarded uh, into NERS directly, and we hope to get like a turnaround time for 650 gigabytes in 90 seconds, which is which is uh, which is really fast. So um, this is, it's really ongoing work. Um, let's see, this is just an example from a, from my postdoc, which was just showing you know all the data that's been pushed through the entire system. Um, he made some great strides in that project, and we're hoping to. To, um, um, to show it off in, in very soon. But Nensim is not the only uh, project using the SF API. Um, we have like uh, 27 non users of made clients. Um, it's not, you know, compared to like the 7,000 users we have at NERSC, it's not really much, but, uh, uh, but the API itself does a lot of work, actually. It has 12 million um, requests locked since, uh, since a year, so 12 million Requests. It's one request every two seconds comes uh, through the API. So SLS uses it for their what is it called uh, the JIP job interface daemon, and also we have a fusion facility wants to do the auto the the instrument the automated data processing between the runs um, with uh, with the API. Okay, let's check. Right, a bit more time. Um, okay, the last thing I will talk about is Jupyter. Um, again, question, is anyone here use Jupyter for the data night speed? Way more. <laughs> okay, you, you're happy to know that we, we, we have jupyter.nest.gov, you know, uh, that's to, support, to support your needs. Yeah, so Jupyter, I didn't mean, don't have to tell you, and it's like an open source web application. You use it for live code, visualizations, all kinds of things, but a lot of, uh, in, uh, very, it's a very uh, useful tool in, in all kinds of data analysis. Um, so why, why do we care about Jupyter? And yeah, it's, been, it's, it's manifest, it's an integral part of uh, uh, big data science. And, and it, was a high, it was a huge um, request from our partners in the SuperCity project. I think across the board, everyone's using it. Um, and also, um, I think I, I'm, I was not from that area. I used actually IPython in Terminal, but nowadays people do everything over notebooks. And I just had a training event when I was in the UK where we also used only Jupyter Notebooks. So this is like the, the way to deliver 
uh, code to, to students nowadays, and they just expect that a Jupyter Notebook will run at NERSC and we accommodate uh, the request. And the Jupyter usage has really gone up in the past years. Um, so here that is uh, up to 1,000 users. And this is, uh, you compare that with like 3,000 users per month that connect via SSH. So, you know, it's a quarter um, or you know, one third compared to the SSH users. So it really, really picked up use um, over the last years. And the cool thing is also that Jupyter has developed at UC Berkeley um, just down the hill from us. So we have a good working relationship with them. And every new feature that comes out of Jupyter has a high chance to be uh, on our systems uh, and vice versa, our requests getting uh, built into Jupyter. So if you want to use Jupyter at NERS, um, you go to Jupyter at NERS .gov, and here again is the banner. It's kind of cool. So Jupyter uses the API and runs on spin. It's really, it's really tightly interconnected, everything. So if you, if you go on there, it uh, um, directs you to authenticate if you need to, and it spawns a notebook server somewhere at NERSC. If you're just a regular user, you have, like a, you have a bunch of options here where you spawn your notebook. And then uh, you're being redirected to it. And there's a, um, oh, I see it comes when I, when I change the slides. So this is the, this is the spawn options that you get as a user. So you can, so you can run it, um, you can choose between permit and Cori, Cori will go away. Uh, but you can, can use like shared CPU node if you just have like a very simple task that just needs like a process. But you can also go and ask for an exclusive CPU. You have a lot of things to do in it exclusive GPU node uh, for the same. And here is also a configurable GPU that is particularly useful if you, if you run a training and you want to know and you make sure that you land on your reservation. And uh, you have to be uh, um, conscious that if you use a shared node, that means other users are on the same node. So it means that you shouldn't you know, run a process that takes up the entire, the whole, whole of the memory of that node. And you know, just like the API is hosted in Spin, Jupyter is also hosted in Spin. I don't know if that's the actual deployment, um, but yeah, we, we host we host Jupyter in our own infrastructure. Um, and Jupyter, as Jupyter is popular with um, with our experimental facilities here, is like an example. Uh, so ALS uh, developed you know a, a custom a Jupyter Hub experience that they run locally um, at their um, facility, but they also want the same uh, to run at NERSC. So unfortunately, um, you know, the, the, the way Jupyter is done, you can't really run that form of customization um, on, uh, on Jupyter at NERSC.gov. But um, there was a new feature, and that is uh, called the entry points feature. So um, it, and Roland instrumented it in a way that uh, if you are an ALS user, you can you get like two new buttons here. This is like MicroCT is the specific group that we have for them, and uh, you can run. This will give you you know very a customized Jupyter experience, and the the image that's been run is actually um, provided uh, by ALS, and they manage to. To, to mount specific directories uh, of uh, NERSC into it and set the access control on it, that what, what, what the user is, sees is they, they log on, they click the specific button from jupyternurse.gov, but they land on a completely customized uh, user experience that, uh, that the compute group at ALS has set up for them. So they can really go, the, the, the overall plan is that they have like a login page, like where they, where they, for the, the ALS hub where they manage their users and then they are diverted from it to, um, to their control computers and then they, they um, forward it to specific services and one of them could be running the Jupyter Notebook uh, at NERSC. So it really kind of, again, it's another way of kind of NERSC under the hood just with the API. So for the for user, again, there would not, wouldn't be, there will not be aware really that they're running at NERSC. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm at the end. So now is your reward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
yeah. So if you have any questions, um, I think we, uh, I think I talked like almost constantly for the for the time. So if do you have any questions about what I have material I shot that you want to see, apart from seeing the dogs? <laughs>